Hello and welcome to today's Tiger webinar. I'm Lydia Palmer from RIT's Division of Development and Alumni Relations and I am your moderator for today's event. We're happy to have you join us today and I hope that you and your entire Tiger family are well. As we continue to weather this new working environment, we want you to know that the RIT Office of Alumni Relations is available to help all RIT alumni with a variety of needs, including new virtual content, learning opportunities, and networking and career assistance through the new normal of pandemic realities. We especially encourage everyone to, con to connect to the RIT Alumni Association social media channels, including Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, where you will find up-to-date communications and opportunities to connect with other Tiger alumni in your region and your industry. Those links are found in the chat box and the chat box can be opened by clicking on the chat tab at the right of your webinar window. Many in our RIT family have asked how they can help our students and the university as we respond to the pandemic and we are incredibly grateful for those offers. There are two ways you can help. First, our new graduates and current students are seeking positions for full-time careers and co-ops. Many of these positions have been delayed or canceled entirely. If your company is hiring or would consider adding a co-op post, please contact Chris Steeler at RIT's Career Services Office and allow her to post that position in our systems. In addition, there is now an unprecedented need for financial aid scholarships for current and incoming Tiger students. If you are able, please make a gift at the link in the chat box, and we thank you very, very much. We want to ensure that everyone is ready and familiar with the presentation tools. If you are joining from a remote location and are currently signed into your company's VPN, we encourage you to close that channel during the webinar to increase the quality of the transmission. The webinar platform is secure without VPN access. All attendees have joined in mute mode. However, your questions can be entered in the chat box at any time throughout the discussion. We will make every effort to address all your comments and questions throughout the webinar. You are joining this event using broadcast audio. If you wish to dial in by phone, dial-in information is provided in the chat box. Live captioning is also being provided and you can find the link to access that in the chat box as well. This webinar will be recorded and made available complete with captions in approximately one week following today's event. All participants will receive an email with the link to the recording. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box as well, and we will do our best to get you the appropriate answers. And now on to today's webinar, Clinical Hypnosis, Changing Minds, Health and Care. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Lawrence Sugarman, RIT Research Professor and Director of the Center for Applied Psychophysiology and Self-Regulation in the College of Health Sciences and Technology. Dr. Sugarman is also a developmental and behavioral pediatrician at the Easter Seals Diagnostic and Treatment Center in Rochester, New York, and a clinical professor in pediatrics at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. Over three decades of pediatric practice, Dr. Sugarman has refined clinical biofeedback and hypnosis strategies that effectively increase resilience and coping skills for young people and families. At RIT, he is focused on evoking the abilities of young people with autism spectrum disorder and other chronic health problems, developing innovative health apps, and improving the pedagogy for professional development in I'm sorry, psychobiological mm -hmm. care. Dr. Sugarman, we thank you so much for joining us today, and our audience is all yours. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, RIT, for making this possible. And I apologize in advance for new multisyllabical words that complicate things, but that's exactly the heart of what we're going to talk about. So it's a pleasure to share with you what I'm learning and thinking about and writing and teaching about uh, uh, at my growing edge uh, today. Uh, uh, I list these uh, affiliations on the first uh, piece of the presentation because all of these organizations allow me to do what I love to do. So I am appreciative and I'm appreciative to all of you for attending. Uh, a little background uh, for I uh, 
for my first 20 years after finishing a pediatric residency at University of Rochester, I took out a loan, hung up a shingle, and ran a solo primary care practice. But right away, I be- felt challenged by uh, the my lack of relative lack of ability and lack of training and focusing on how to help children help themselves. Our training teaches us to uh, diagnose and treat and to do procedures and to know what tests to order in response and reaction to illness, but relatively little, especially uh, and, and including in pediatrics, ideally a preventive field, and how to invest in young people's mental health. And now at my age, I call young people anybody younger than me. After about 20 years, my focus became exclusively that, and I moved on to work at the Easter Seals Diagnostic and Treatment Center, where I still am seeing families and young people uh, two days a week. I've been at RIT now for the last 10 years, teaching and writing, and as Lydia said, focusing on changing healthcare. So that's how I got here. In that sense, I guess I'm a typical RIT faculty member. I have a really strange background. Uh, So I should mention my three other children. Uh, When I was in primary care, I uh, decided that what we really needed, kind of spurred by Bill Moyer's Healing in the Mind, to uh, develop a video documentary about how to integrate these skills into practice. And we'll be, I'll be showing a couple of clips from that, uh, even though it's now 23 years old. And then a first and second edition of a book about for clinicians, about how to integrate mind-body skills into across the spectrum of pediatric care, from primary care through procedures, surgery, and all the way to palliative care and death and dying. But I do need to focus most on the, how, what I've spent the last two and a half years of my life doing, and that is uh, this book, which is a, a new textbook, uh, and, and really uh, the focus of this presentation. Uh, I'm not, I'm really bad at promoting my work, and, and I don't mean to be promoting this book, but it is what my life has been about, as my wife can attest. And, uh, and so, and I will be referring to it, so it bears some introduction, because it's not only about how to do these clinical skills. It's about the psychobiology of, of the current science on how we make up our minds. We'll talk about that term, how they change the role of clinical skills in changing those minds, which I will call clinical hypnosis, the role of human development and relationships in that, and then primarily uh, focused at the net at the end of this talk, what that means about changing health and care. In a sense, it's both a clinical book and a philosophy of science book. Those concepts are pretty abstract unless they're about individual people. And so intertwined between each chapter of the discourse is an episode of four short stories of people across the lifespan and across the span of development and gender. My co-author Julie Linden and I conceived of this years ago, and then my best friend from ninth grade, Lee Brooks, a retired professor of English composition and poetry, helped write these stories and had the brilliant idea of at the end of the book, having these four characters turn to the reader and address them. It's very fulfilling to mention that this amazing cover was uh, rendered by Jim Perkins, who is who heads our medical illustration program. So what we're going to talk about today is what we mean by this word hypnosis. It's an attention getter on purpose. Where we are now in our healthcare paradigm, we'll talk about the meaning of allopathic and paradigm. What 
we may be missing and what may be the cracks in this paradigm. And then envisioning what might be coming next. Now, let's start with this misunderstood term, hypnosis. The term was probably coined by James Braid, a Manchester surgeon who uh, trained in Ed Edinburgh, who happened to go to a traveling mesmerist show in the 1840s by a Frenchman named La Fontaine, who purported to use animal magnetism to cause people to change, similar to what you can see in Las Vegas and on many college campuses across the United States. And he did that as a complete skeptic. He was a surgeon. But he was intrigued and then changed his career to study this psychophysiological phenomena. Psychophysiology is another term he coined. And in one of his treatises introducing this wrote, whether these extraordinary physical effects are produced through the imagination chiefly or by other means, it appears to me quite certain that the imagination has never been so much under our control or capable of being made to act in the same beneficial and uniform manner by any other mode of management hitherto known. He also wrote later, the more we study the fields of psychology and physiology apart, the more we do so to the detriment of both. So he was an amazing hero in terms of seeing something for the first time, something old the first time in a new way. But I know when I travel, I hope to travel again someday, when I travel and find myself on a train or an airplane sitting next to somebody and the conversation goes around to what do you do, I have to sigh before I decide whether I'm going to use the H word because starting with Svengali and Trilby, Du Maurier wrote the book Trilby in the 1890s and it was so intriguing that it was the first book to outsell the Bible. And there in the 1910s became the movie, the uh, soundless movie, well, it had music and here's the evil Svengali putting the the innocent Trilby, who, by the way, said a fashion statement because she wore a hat in the movie that then got copied and called it Trilby Hat, under his power to be for undue influence. And then there came other films and pieces of culture about the evil influence of this field, plus its use for entertainment and objectification. And my good friend Stephen Hassan is a world expert in talking about undue influence and cults, all of this having to do with interpersonal and undue influence agreed most of the hypnosis on the planet is not really for people's benefit. But I do mean hypnosis. I want to honor its history. By hypnosis, I mean a discipline for interpersonal communication that cultivates psychobiological plasticity, our ability to change our minds, our agility within the entire system of brain and body in order to change feelings, thoughts, behavior at all levels throughout the embodied mind. And as we'll see, including immunology, physiology, and even gene expression. And when we use that influence in clinical settings, in other words, under the ethical canons of doing no harm, of only focusing on the benefit of the person in our care, with full respect for their autonomy and their knowledge, no deception, with out regard for ability, pay, or access, equal access to care for everybody. Well, then we're talking about clinical hypnosis. And that's the field that has been my passion for over 30 years. Now, 
I could go on and do what I've done for the last 25 years of teaching clinicians around the planet about clinical skills and how these practices have been integrated into healthcare in powerful ways and the literature supporting the role of mind-body interaction as part of healthcare uh, and all of the supportive evidence. But I'm not going to, we'll touch on some episodes, uh, evidence of that, but I'm not going to for two reasons. First of all, I'm in the business of changing my mind and that's not my growing edge. That's not what I'm learning. But more importantly, these are, these are critical times. The pandemic has opened the cracks in world health care, but especially here in the United States, exposing disparities, exposing problems in our health care delivery and the health care that is delivered. And so I'm going to take a higher view about what does the role of these skills mean for changing health and care? So now Stephen's going to show you a video from that first uh, from that first product. That video. Matt Matthew is a 16-year-old who learned self-hypnosis to manage his migraine headaches. My twin brother and I, we both had migraines around the same time when we were about 10 years old. And they were basically the same. Um, they would be preceded by flashes of light, like you would look into a, a light bulb. And um, relatively quickly, about a half hour afterwards, you know, you get the big pounding, throbbing headaches. Um, you know, laying down, you have to puke a lot. And um, he grew out of it when he was about 12. Mine kept getting steadily more intense. And I would get them just about any time of day. I got them in school, I got them at home, I got them at night. And they were murder. Matthew described his technique and how he has expanded using self-hypnosis in other areas of his life. Well, what I do first is um, get my breathing down. Usually it's big, heavy breaths. And basically just kind of concentrate, focus my attention on that. And um, when I'm nice and relaxed, I um, imagine the safest place I can, and it's always a drawing table right in the middle of nowhere. I'm all alone. And um, what I do is I imagine my problems as um, something that I can draw or something that's already been drawn. And I evaluate how bad it is by a number scale at the top of the desk. And what I do is through either erasing it or painting over it or something like that, I can get rid of the problem. And um, I've used it for uh, many different reasons. I've used it to concentrate in school, to um, kind of refocus my anger, try and calm down. I've used it to fall asleep at night. Um, of course, I've used it to get rid of my headaches. I think of different things every time I use it. I mean, I just started playing soccer again um, a couple of weeks ago after taking a break for refereeing. and. I was just laying there taking a nap one day before my first game, and I thought, well, we'll see what's gonna, ha we'll see what happens if I, uh, I'm, you know, draw myself scoring a goal. And sure enough, that game I scored. So I thought, well, this is a good thing. Tried it again next week, and it worked. And tried it again next week, and it worked. And I do it before every game now. I sincerely think it just, it puts into my mind the idea that I'm going to score a goal no matter what. And that's what I think the hypnosis did for me. Great. I could say so much about this because, again, that was when he was 16 and it was 23 years ago. I only want to say two things. That was Matthew's version of what he's learned. There's lots of different ways to do these, use these skills. And second, what is almost universal is the learning, especially when we're young, but at any age, of skills for changing one thing has a beneficial overflow in saying, well, wait, if I can do this, I can do that. And he exemplifies that. So that's what we mean by hypnosis. Now let's shift.
What about this allopathic paradigm? Well, we can't talk about that without talking about Thomas Kuhn. His book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, I was forced to read as a second year college student. Um, and then I read again as I went into practice, and then I read, read again in preparation for writing this book. The word paradigm was out there as a literary reference and a, and a linguistic reference and comes from the idea of one model next to another. But Kuhn revised it in terms of thinking about science and our conception of reality and defined it as a set of beliefs, tools, and methods that intertwine to create our understanding. Uh, yes, a student gave me a wonderful gift. The shift key broke on his computer and he took it off and glued two dimes together and gave it to me. So that's on my desk. But it's important to understand that a paradigm actually doesn't exist in the real world. It exists in our minds. It's how we perceive reality because we uh, we, when we see a, a nail, a nail is for a hammer because that's how it's used. When we have a headache, we think we should use medicine because that's how it works. When we conceive of, a, of depression or anxiety, we have been taught that that's a chemical imbalance and that's why we use chemicals to fix it. It's forms our perception. But Kuhn didn't write about paradigms. Kuhn wrote about changing paradigms, the structure of scientific revolutions. And he also used this word, literally meaning, doesn't have a name, or to use Donald Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld's illusion, an unknown, unknown. Anomalies were things that didn't fit that didn't fit the paradigm. For example, back when we knew that the Earth was the center of the solar system and the universe, there became anomalies because planets and heavenly bodies started exhibiting retrograde motion and moving in ways they weren't supposed to. Generally, we disregard these anomalies, spontaneous regression of cancer or somebody using some type of emotional therapy and something immunological happens. We disregard them as and call them serendipity or just happenstance until they build to a point where they cannot be reconciled. And that's when the scientific revolution occurs and there is what he calls a paradigm shift. And suddenly all the planets and heavenly bodies are still there the earth and the sun and the moon are still there, but they are moving according to an adjusted set of rules. Generally, but not always, the new paradigm includes the old one and shifts it. Kuhn referred to this as a gestalt shift, similar to these optical illusions where one either sees the faces or sees the vase, but cannot see them both at the same time. Now, when Kuhn wrote this book in 1962, or published this book in 1962, he never mentioned health, health care, or medicine. They're not in the book. He refers to the field of psychology in 1962 as a pre-paradigmatic field that, that may hope to become a science. He never included healthcare as a science leading towards revolution. The dominant Western medical paradigm over the last 150 to 200 years has its own set with, thanks to Rembrandt, a set of beliefs that problems and healthcare conditions and illnesses can be reduced to a cellular level that their understanding is best done at a at the lowest level of understanding of, of refinement 
and that these can be inter, can be made into categories and within those categories we can identify monistic cause and effect linear relationships to understand disease and so the method is one of diagnosis how exactly does this occur at the finest level of refinement and then how do we use external tools even protocols medications procedures implants materialistic approach to fix the deficit and that has been the modern western dominant paradigm this paradigm arguably starting somewhere in the mid 1800s around the time of uh, of uh, James Braid has had accomplishments that probably eclipse in their social import the revolution of interactive media and the internet in the last 50 to 60 years. There have been miracles without question, and they've certainly reinforced our paradigm that we can fix what's broken within us. But we are cresting that wave. These accomplish accomplishments, arguably the United States is the epicenter of this model. It's certainly the home of this model. And in the United States, we lead our economically developed competitors in per capita as percent of GDP expenses in healthcare pulling away and also pulling away the lowest life expectancy. Worldwide, our children, the coming generation, the coming healthcare bill, lead the world in weight, cardiovascular risk factors, and the consumption of prescribed psychoactive drugs. The latest data being that psychoactive drugs are consumed as prescribed by children in the United States equal to the rest of the world, unless we're talking about psychostimulants for attentional problems, and then it's 10 times. And of course, opiate overdose deaths have eclipsed accidents, homicides, and suicide since 2014. And I could go on with the dark list. For all we have accomplished, there seems to be cracks in this paradigm. My colleague and mentor, Mark Jensen, who runs research into mind, body, health, and especially pain at the University of Washington, wrote this in the foreword to our book. Knowledge is gradually being translated into new treatments that have the potential to improve our health and well being, and yet something is seriously wrong. Despite significant advances in our understanding about the mechanisms underlying disease, illness, and health, we're witnessing an alarming upsurge in the rates of diabetes, obesity, insomnia, attention deficit disorder, depression, drug abuse, and their precursors. At the same time, more resources than ever are being devoted to health care and the prevention of illness. Clearly, however, we are currently translating our disease research into effective clinical practice is not working. And everyone knows, at least at some level, about the rule of holes. If you find yourself in one, stop digging. So what's that about? What are those cracks about? What, what are these anomalies? In 1971, nine years after the publication of Kuhn's book, George Engel, an internist in Rochester and later affiliated with the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Rochester, wrote about a new model that he called the biopsychosocial model. We're still interested in the most reductionist we could get, what happens inside of the cell. But he wanted to increase the inputs into what happened inside of the cell to include relationships, culture, emotions, community, I could go on, perception, life experience. These days we would add trauma. 
to understand how those added a level of complexity. And this biopsychosocial notion changed everything in terms of thinking about interconnections. So I'm going to mention just a few of these examples. Interestingly, when, why is the slide change? There we go. Interestingly, one of Engel's mentees was a young psychologist, research psychologist named Robert Ader. And he came to the University of Rochester to understand how, how to condition effects. He was a pure behavioral psychologist and he worked with lots of rats. And he was trying to find out about conditioning their immune response. He was interested in the effects of, immune, uh, of an immune drug on them, but he had to blind them and he would give them the drug and then take it away without going into great detail in this experiment. He serendipitously and unintentionally discovered that he was conditioning their immune system with the flavor of saccharin. That once the pairing of the immunosuppressive drug and saccharin had been done, and then he continued to use the saccharin, the rat's immune systems continued to respond as if they were receiving an immunosuppressive drug. And that gave birth to the field psychoneuroimmunology. The fifth edition of the textbook is two huge volumes of mechanism and understanding of how perception and feeling and experience condition our immune system and the reverse. One of my colleagues, Karen Olness, in the 1980s did this experiment. 60 children, six to 11 years of age, were all invited to spit in a test tube. They really loved that opportunity. They spit in a test tube. And then they were all shown a movie. And the movie was an animated movie about uh, how the immune system works with little characters, including characters for immunoglobulin A, the immunoglobulin that occupies our spit and our snot. I'm sure they giggled when they saw that. And then each of them was invited to a session. They were spit in a test tube after the movie, and then they were invited to a session. Some of them played games with the examiners for about a half hour. Some of them were introduced to self-hypnosis an opportunity to actively imagine fun things and feel better and feel like you're really there. Kids, all of us as kids, are really good at that. And some of them were invited to engage in that session. And during that session, they were asked to really imagine increasing that immunoglobulin A character in their spit and their snot. And that is a statistically significant increase. Two years later, a psychology postdoc replicated this experiment in Australia with children who had two standard deviations greater than the mean of upper respiratory infections. And the children who were taught to increase their immunoglobulin A had the following winter a significant decrease in the amount of respiratory infections. The second theme that I want to introduce is about the embodied mind, that our mind is a complex system that occupies our entire body, not just our heads, it's not just in our brains. And Candace Pert really led that revolution. She was the first woman to head a lab at the National Institutes of Health. And I think it was her personality and vision that allowed this discovery to occur, she described it in a 1994 interview with Bill Moyers in Healing in the Mind. Stephen? Waiting for the second video. How then do these inseparable components talk to one another? 
What language do they speak? Candace Perk, a neuroscientist formerly with the National Institute of Mental Health, has mapped the chemicals which she believes may carry the messages, the neuropeptides. Now, what is a neuropeptide? Peptides are strings of amino acids uh, strung together very much like pearls uh, strung along in, in a necklace. And a neuropeptide is a peptide that was first found in the brain, but then later on, we found that they were everywhere, and that these molecules are being released from one place. They're diffusing, they're binding, and they're uh, tickling these receptors that are on the surface of cells. Every cell in your body is encrusted with receptors of various types. Like a satellite dish that's receiving a, a signal. Facing outward like a satellite dish and receiving, putting out their little antenna and receiving what's coming in. Everything in your body as it's running is being run by these messenger molecules. What do you mean by that? Well, the cells have to talk to each other, otherwise the whole organism can't hang together. And the cells have to talk. Now, I guess you're going to ask me what they talk about. Yeah, I was just <laughs> going to ask you, what do they talk about? It might just be make a little more of this protein or make a little less of, the, of that protein or these cells stop dividing because we've got to put our energy into digestion. In a way, one way to think of uh, the neuropeptides as we've come to think of them is directing where the body should pay attention, where the body should put its energy. Lay down and relax so you can digest your food, man, or you're going to die. That kind of message. But, but of course, on a cellular level, There's hundreds of scientists who have mapped where these molecules are and found them in the various parts of the body. After years of studying these various peptides and studying how they were distributed and their characteristics, we came to hypothesize that these were the biochemicals of emotion. Biochemicals? The biochemicals of emotion. We were nervous to call them that, and it took us 15 years of research before we dared to call them that, but they were found in the parts of the brain that mediated emotion. They control the opening and closing of your blood vessels in your face and the flushes of emotion. They get released during various kinds of emotional states. We wanted to make some kind of sense out of all of this data. Are you saying that the mind talks to the body, so to speak, through these neuropeptides? Um, why are you making the mind outside of the body? That's the way I was raised. Yeah, that's because you're part of Western civilization. I mean, I was taught that the mind is somehow distinct from the body. It's something in here, uh, in, the, in the brain. Well, that just all goes back to a, a turf deal that, got, that Descartes made with the Roman Catholic Church. And <laughs> he got to study science as we know it and left the soul and the mind and consciousness and emotions in the other realm that was the realm of the church remember i'm a scientist in the western tradition and i don't use the word spirit i'm not allowed you know soul is a four-letter word in our tradition you know the deal was struck with descartes we don't invoke that stuff the brain is talking to me unconsciously i mean or instantly through this reaction in the receptor the me that you say is me, you're still thinking it's your brain. The me that's you is your whole body. So that the intelligence is... It's the wisdom of the body. The intelligence is in every cell of your body. The mind is not confined to the space above the neck. The mind is throughout the brain and body. Later on in this book, Pert did an analysis with others and came to the stunning conclusion that of all of that synaptic traffic from neuron to neuron in the central nervous system, that whole information flow that our students try to memorize in their neuroanatomy courses only accounts for 7% of the information that goes in our central nervous system. And the rest are the receptors, the satellite dishes on these cells. This level of complexity is almost unimaginable because now we understand that insulin doesn't know that, it re that it's a member of the Department of Endocrinology or that immunoglobulin A only belongs 
to immunology, that there are receptors for all of these messenger molecules, regardless of turf wars in departments of medicine. Another area that shows a crack in the paradigm is placebo effect research. I teach a course on placebo effect research, the wonderful textbook by Fabrizio Benedetti. And here's the basis of that research. We give a drug or do a procedure, any type of healthcare intervention, and we see an effect. Now, to make sure the effect is direct and so-called biological, we also use a similar procedure that we call a placebo. Maybe we give a pill of the same color, but with non-active ingredients in it. And the difference between the placebo effect and the total effect is what we call the drug effect. And for the history of placebo research, which believe it or not, only became standard in the United States in the last 50 years. Most of our interventions were not based on this type of control. Well, we disregard that is that's the floor. We're not interested in the floor. We're interested in what's above the floor, the drug effect. Except that those effects are really interesting because they are almost always the majority of the effect. And so Benedetti and others, Irving Kirsch, Ted Kapchuk at the University of at Harvard and, um, and others at Stanford began to develop laboratories to say, wait, what are those effects? Here's an example of the type of research being done. In a large and very controversial meta-analysis of pharmacotherapy, drug therapy, drug antidepressant drugs, Kirsch and Saperstein found from thousands of participants in dozens of studies that a drug, oops, sorry, do this again, that drug effects and psychotherapy, we're getting there, patients, this may happen again. We're essentially equal, no statistically significant difference. Good. Drug effect, psychotherapy. And then a placebo, as compared to placebo effects, that IA means inactive. Now you may say, well, that's redundant. Aren't placebos inactive? Well, placebos can produce side effects if they're designed that way. Let's imagine that you were given a drug for depression that causes some drowsiness. Well, Benadryl, diphenhydramine, is an antihistamine for allergy, and it also causes some drowsiness. There's no evidence it does anything for depression. So if we gave that as a placebo, it would be an active placebo. You really wouldn't be able to tell a difference. Anyway, these were inactive placebos. And what the results of this meta-analysis show is that it's really important if you have depression to do something because there's about a 25% chance that you'll get better and about a 75% chance you're not going to get much better or could get worse. An effect size of 0.8 is quite significant. But more importantly, is that 75% of the effect of drug or psychotherapy can be attributed to inactive placebos. And that in the few studies, because it's not popular to do studies with active placebos, where active placebos were used, there was no significant difference between placebo and drug. I am not recommending that any of you or anybody stop using antidepressant drugs, but I am simply reporting on what the data shows and what placebo research shows. 
placebo research gives us insight into what we can do in response to suggestion and conditioning to healthcare interventions. It was so powerful that this occurred halfway through or 60% through the course and placebo effects that I gave my students the opportunity to change their written projects from placebo effects to looking at placebo effects through the pandemic. Here's O'Hare Airport on that horrible day in March. Think about the crowd, the stress, the anxiety, the jet lag of all of these people and what it does to their immune response. We know that stress, trauma, and conditioning can decrease the effectiveness of a vaccine. One of the questions that students had to answer in the course near the end was this. Human beings have been on this planet in our present anatomical form for about 200,000 years and probably civilized for the last 10 to 20,000 years. How come we've developed these innate abilities for self-regulation, but always externally attribute them to something somebody does to us or for us? You give me a sugar pill and it works and I thank you and pay you money. How come, how is that an evolutionary advantage? Why do we externally attribute our own abilities? Well, I ask that question every year, but this year, one of our RIT students gave me a stunning answer. We didn't evolve to externally attribute our own abilities. We evolved to use our relationships to activate them. That's how it works. We are intimately involved in changing each other's minds. In our relationships, we are tribal creatures and we can use that to strengthen ourselves. Finally, my one of another mentor and colleague, Ernest Rossi, really was instrumental in finding, founding the field of psychosocial genomics, thinking in terms of Engel's model, how our interactions and specifically novel, exciting, intriguing interactions, what we may call hypnotic interactions, change gene expression. He helped co-found a research center at the University Medical Center in Salerno, Italy, where they are piloting a a hypnotic protocol that drives novelty and interest and curiosity and positivity to show how it changes gene expression and specifically now with women with metastatic breast cancer showing that this intervention changes their immune response to be more effective at decreasing cancer. So these are changes in the system. These are anomalies. These explain so many strange things that occur. And the sum total is that our mind is an infinitely complex embodied system that cannot be divided into neurology or immunology. Those are fine for areas of study, but they're not real divisions. They're not really how we work. Not only that, but your mind, and mine too, is actually even more uniquely composed because while diagnoses may fit certain criteria, how we come into and out of those diagnoses, how we develop those are as individual as our life experiences. And so this is a case for having to study personalized care. How do you work individually as compared to people who have your diagnostic condition? And not only that, but the power of our relationships is much more impactful than we ever understood. That how we form relationships and evoke physiologic change in others is critical. And finally, 
that health is not the absence of disease. Health is our agility in changing our minds. And by minds, I don't mean my opinion. I mean the whole system. How do we do that importantly? How do we do that intentionally? So that leads to the final piece. Health is not the absence of disease. One of the healthiest persons I ever met was a, a, a funder for our original work at RIT. He died in a hospice that he helped to build, surrounded by people from around the world who came to visit him, unconnected to medication or an IV. And in his last few days, as I sat with him, I said, you know, you're the healthiest person I've ever met. But according to our model, our old model, he was dying, so he couldn't be healthy. What if we imagine that health is the Venn diagram intersection of secure, supportive relationships in a trophic environment, the opposite of toxic, and informed by our ability to change, our automatic, our autonomic ability to change our immune system? What if health care becomes the focus of, it becomes focused on psychobiological agility. And instead of diagnose and treat, we think in terms of what are innate resources? How do I know how to use my imagination to change my immune system? How do I know how to conceptualize? How do I change my mind when I play music or exercise? And how do I minimize my risks, my family history of colon cancer. Well, I can minimize that by having a plant-based diet, but how do I do that in this culture? That's really hard. Oh, that requires some changing of my mind, some hypnotic strategies about how I use food. So what if this became the focus of healthcare across our lifespan? Now, what if as part of all of our healthcare, our assignment was not to diagnose, but our assignment was to look for somebody's innate recess resources to minimize their genetic, cultural, financial risks, and doing that by teaching them how to change. Well, the old paradigm includes is included in the new one. Every one of us is going to get something. Every one of us will meet a criteria for diagnosis and treatment. And then I want all of the data and research done on those allopathic interventions brought to bear to help me. But I'm going to do it by minimizing my risk of doing that and living to my fullest with the help of my healthcare clinicians. Let me end by giving you an example of just how we do that at a granular level. This is eight-year-old Joey, 23 years ago. I know him now. Now, how wide is your mouth? And this is a physical exam. Excellent. Wait, hold it, Stephen. That's pause. Very Can you pause it? You... I want you to notice that this is a normal physical exam of Joey. He is not told to do anything. The purpose of this exam is to Im include his ability to be aware of his body and how to change it. Oops, now you can do it. Now, how wide is your mouth open with your tongue sticking out? Excellent. That's very polite when you see me. Don't do it if you go out to dinner, though. <laughs> you can, oh, your tongue can go back in. Bye, tongue. Thank you. See you later. Now, let me listen to your heart. Do you know where it is? Where did you leave it? Right there? You're absolutely right. You sure know your body, don't you? You're really good at holding still. Very good. Can you hear your own heart? Mm -hmm. Can you feel it beating? Mm -hmm. Now, I'd just like you to breathe normally so I can hear what it sounds like. That's right. You're very good at doing that. 
Have you been practicing breathing normally? Yeah. Well, you're a professional breather. You sound like you've been breathing all your life. Yeah? <laughs> you're good at it. Now, what happens when you take a nice breath out? Try it. Let's see what happens. When you... That's where you get all comfortable, don't you? Do it again. See what happens. That's always a nice way to relax. If that it relaxes your tummy. See how soft your tummy can get when I feel it. Wow, get squishy. Can you make it as, wow, I can feel all the way to the back. Can you make it as soft on this side? Can you make it a little softer? How do you do that? Sure you okay. Do. You do it by just relaxing and breathing. That's right, so, just like that. Good job. I know this has been a very high up superficial view. I really hope it provokes a lot of questions and wondering. I hope there are a lot of gaps. They're in the book. Uh, and the book goes into more detail about clinical work. But I hope that this has given you an idea of what we're thinking about and what I'm teaching. And I'm once again, welcome your questions and am grateful to all of you for attending and to RIT for making this presentation possible. Thank you, Dr. Sugarman. Um, we do have a couple of questions and comments. Um, Bill, who identifies himself as a 66-year-old man who consumes 20 milligrams of methylphenidate ER every day, mm -hmm. Um, he says ADD involves many different interpersonal difficulties, not just one. Could mm -hmm. hypnosis and visualization help several problems or just one at a time? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. A great question. Uh, I would not use the term visualization personally because there's so many ways we run our imaginations other than what we see, that's just one mode. And we never do visualization with the visually impaired, do we? Listen to Stevie Wonder's songs. He doesn't have any visual imagery in any of his songs. So hypnosis does whatever you tell it to do because it's yours. Hypnosis can be, a, I'll give an example. I worked with a, a boy who was using methylphenidate Long ago, before there was an ER, before it could be sustained, and so it wore off in the afternoon in school, and he said, you know, paying attention and sitting at my desk is painful. And I had never used these skills in somebody like him before, but I certainly knew about using hypnosis for pain, which, of course, is the ultimate metaphor for everything. So. He went, he was also an expert at roller coasters. He knew every roller coaster at every amusement park within 200 miles of Rochester, New York. And he knew their timing. He was meticulous. So he could take a roller coaster ride in a roller coaster that he drove. His feet were brake and accelerator pedals. So he could sit at his desk and push them to the ground in various amounts using his embodied mind to speed up and slow down knowing that it really wasn't allowed to ride a roller coaster in his fourth grade classroom. But he could get away with it and use that to stay focused and comfortable. So there are as many interpersonal and internal aspects to these conditions because these conditions are unique in each individual person. So how he would learn to use hypnosis for given aspect or how he would do it. Sorry to be obtuse but everybody's individual. <laughs> um, and one more question that I think uh, Jody may need to contact you directly. She says, can you speak to how we use self-hypnosis to manage anxiety in teens? What does that model yes. look like? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, first of all, let me say self-hypnosis is used all the time because it's what I do when I'm doing this by myself, but all self-hypnosis is learned from another person. We're all influenced by each other. Milton Erickson, a leader in the field, one of his famous books is called My Voice Will Go With You. So 
Let me put it this way. And, and let me give you an example. She said, what does that model look like? How about a model? There are as many models as there are creative people with anxiety and creative people who can help them. And I would add that people with anxiety are very creative and very good at changing their minds with their imaginations because they spend a lot of time imagining horrible things and letting their body react to it. So here's a model. Anxiety is a model for looking forward with dread, for being meticulously good at making real horrible things that could happen in a way that gets us stuck and paralyzed. The opposite of anxiety isn't being calm. The opposite of anxiety is looking forward to the unknown and uncertainty of life with excitement. Oh boy, my heart rate will go up either way. But the valence, the emotional valence is what is discovery like? So it's the hypnotic process is shifting a view of the future from dread and valuing the, the carefulness and the vigilance that that helps us, that keeps us safe and keeps us from walk, crossing the street without looking while turning on our capacity, however trauma informed, to look towards the uncertainty of the future with excitement, exploring those abilities to be excited and happy as resources that we bring to bear. So that's the model, a model, my model for now. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And we do have a couple of other comments that we will share with Dr. Sugarman, but we are thank a you. minute or two over time. So we want to thank you, Dr. Sugarman, for sharing this very valuable information with our Tiger audience. If anyone does have additional questions, you can email them to ritalum at rit.edu and we'll direct your questions to Dr. Sugarman. All audience members, again, will receive an email from us in about a week with a link to today's webinar recording. You can see a full listing of upcoming virtual events just like today's webinar at rit.edu slash alumni slash tigers dash staying dash home. Uh, you'll find quite a number of opportunities presented there that we are sharing each week, and we'd like to include you in as many of these as possible. Uh, please exit the webinar by just closing your browser window, and do let us know what you thought of this event through a brief survey that you will receive via email. Dr. Sugarman, again, thank you so much, thank and you. everyone, please have a wonderful week and stay safe.